Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women are likewise to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, so that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned, so that an opponent may be put to shame, <coughs> having nothing evil to say about us. Slaves are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith, so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. So let's pray. God, thank you for your word, Lord. I pray that you would help me to be faithful to your word tonight, God. I pray that you would um, just be with these women that are listening, Lord, that you would help us to see what you have to say from your word. Help us to walk away from, from this time with a deeper knowledge of you and what you have for us, God. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So you guys made it to Titus 2 night. Um, I don't know what your background, background is with Titus 2, but I've been in church my entire life, and I cannot tell you how many times I have been taught about the Titus 2 mandate, Titus 2 biblical womanhood, Titus 2 mentoring ministries, Titus 2 discipleship, Titus 2 feminine appeal, and Titus 2 spiritual motherhood. I've been taught a lot about Titus 2, and yet in all, and I do mean all, of my teaching that I've heard, about Titus 2, I cannot recall a single time that I was ever taught about the historical or literary context of this chapter. I do not recall ever hearing any teaching about the Cretan culture or how Titus 2 relates to Titus 1 or Titus 3. Rather, I was taught to read only a few select verses in Titus 2 that spoke about women and then apply them directly to my life. I was taught the seven virtues of a godly wife and mother as a checklist that was to be the entire focus of my life. One of the benefits of studying a whole book of the Bible, the way that we have been, is that when we reach a passage like Titus 2 that might be familiar to us, we're able to properly interpret it within the context of the entire letter. And as a women's ministry leadership team, one of the things that we were so excited in developing this study was that we're able to uh, train ourselves to approach all of scripture this way, to study entire books of the Bible rather than isolated passages that seem to speak to what we think a particular topic is assigned to it. So tonight, we get to reap some of the benefits of the work that we've put into our study so far. So remember, with any text, we first ask, what does this mean for them then? And then we look at what the passage teaches us about Jesus and what timeless truth it tells us about God. And then we look for application to us now. What we don't do is read a passage and then immediately ask, what does this mean for me today? If we do that, we can miss out on what the text is showing us about Jesus. And we can also do lots of damage to ourselves and others by believing or even teaching that the Bible says something that it doesn't actually say. So let's review our context. First, we're going to look at the historical context and then the literary context. So you guys already know this, we've talked about it a lot, but this letter was written to Titus, who is developing churches in Crete. Cretans were known to be liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. They lived their lives however they pleased. They spent their days drinking mojitos on the beach, hooking up with whoever they wanted. Their god was Zeus, who was portrayed in Greek mythology as deceptive, promiscuous, and taking from his people and they considered these good things. This was what they worshiped. And Jesus, in his wisdom and sovereignty, called his church to go out to these kinds of people in this kind of place. So that's what the historical context is for Crete, but now if we zoom out and look at what the overall context is of Gre the Greco-Roman world at this time, it can give us an even better picture of our context. So Rachel Miller, who wrote an excellent book called Beyond Authority and Submission, talks about what life was like for men and women in the Greco-Roman world. Basically, if you were a man, it was great. Life was wonderful for you. And if you were a woman, it was terrible. 
According to Greek mythology, women were the worst plague Zeus ever created. And remember, the, wor the Cretans worshipped Zeus. Women at this time were considered morally, physically, intellectually, and emotionally weaker than men. Men were viewed as rational, strong, courageous, and made to rule, while women were viewed as irrational, weak, nervous, and made to obey. Women were viewed as hysterical, and even the Greek word for uterus was hysterica, which is where we get our English words of hysteria or hysterical. Greek physicians such as Hippocrates believed that a woman's uterus wandered around inside of her body and pressed up against her internal organs, causing great mental and psychological distress. So they believed there was scientific evidence that backed up their assumption that all women were basket cases all of the time. And because of this, women were of course not seen as capable of rational thought. And therefore, their contribution to society was not in the arts or academia, but rather in providing stable home lives for their husbands and children. It was the man's job to think and work and provide for his family. It was the wife's job to make a home that was restful and welcoming for her husband after a long day of important work. Women were usually educated only in the basics of reading and writing, but most of their education was in the domestic arts. Rachel Miller again writes, there was a double standard when it came to morality. While wives were expected to be sexually faithful, husbands were not. The female Greek philosopher Phintias wrote, a woman's greatest virtue is chastity. Courage and intelligence are more appropriately male qualities because of the strength of men's bodies and the power of their minds. Chastity is more appropriately feminine. And while upper class and wealthy women stayed home or went out in public with male guardians, most women were not protected and they were considered sexually available if they were out in public. And a husband could charge his wife with adultery and could divorce her, keep the children, and prevent her from ever seeing them. And this was true even if her adultery was not consensual. Again, quoting Rachel Miller, if a, husband, if a wife offended her husband, he could kill her and even be applauded for it. So none of this is pleasant to think about, but it is the reality of them then. Paul is addressing a specific group of people at a specific time in history. We need to understand the world of the original audience so that we can see Paul's aim for his original audience. This will also shed light on how we are to interpret this for us today. For Paul's audience, the lines that were drawn between men and women were very distinct. Given the historical context then, does it make sense to you that Paul's word for women would be to put them in their place and to make sure that they understood gender distinctions? My point is that historical context matters. So that's our historical context, and now let's look at our literary context. We already discussed in our homework time that our passage begins with but, Paul is contrasting the false teachers of the last section with what he's calling Titus to. Verse 1, but as for you, Titus, as for you, be different. Don't be like the false teachers. And as for you, Titus, teach what accords with sound doctrine. And Paul also gives Titus specific instructions in verses 7 through 8. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works. <clears throat> and in your teaching, show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned, so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. Titus is not called to hypocritically tell others how to live their lives without also obeying God's word himself. He's called to integrity, dignity, and sound speech. He's called to live a life that is the opposite of a liar, evil beast, and lazy glutton. If false teachers profess to know God but deny him by their works, Titus is called to affirm his beliefs by his actions. In order for Titus to teach what accords with sound doctrine, he must exemplify this in his own life. So that's why in verse 1, Paul tells Titus to teach what accords with sound doctrine. And just like he did with the qualifications for elders, remember he started with the general above reproach and then went down to specifics. He's doing that again here. He starts with a general statement, teach what accords with sound doctrine. And then he tells Titus here to teach the church to be godly in their actions. So he's going to get from that general statement down into the specifics. 
So um, when my kids were younger, I always took them to this playground that was right next to a Christian school. And every morning, it was right around the time that school was starting. And so parents would be walking their kids into school. And um, there was one time that this mom was kind of running late. And understandably, she was frustrated and just impatient with her kids. But her two children, her two daughters, were named Mercy and Grace. So it's kind of funny because she's yelling at them, just berating them, Mercy, Grace, hurry up! Mercy, Grace, I've had it with you! So when Christians claim to love Jesus and then blatantly disobey scripture, I think it's just a little bit like that. The things that they claim are in stark contrast to the way that they live, and the world ends up thinking that the Bible is a joke. Only when God's word changes the way we live in tangible ways are people curious about why we are different. So the church, men and women, young and old, slave and free, are all on a shared mission. The shared mission is reflecting the truth of the gospel in both our words and actions. The specifics of what this will look like will vary depending on the specifics of our lives, but the mission is the same. So let's get to those specifics. While men and women are called to a shared mission, it's not as though men and women are interchangeable. Paul does address different groups of people according to Greco-Roman household codes. He is addressing his audience where they are in their historical cultural context. He isn't inventing gender distinctions and then teaching them to the Cretans, but rather he's taking what's already in Crete and then instructing them how to show off the gospel in their everyday lives. So we see five groups of people listed here. The first is older men, older women, younger women, younger men, and then slaves or bond servants. Paul gives each group very specific examples of what godliness looks like for their unique situation. These are not checklists that each group should abide by, but rather examples of the kinds of things that godliness will look like for each group. And how do we know this? Again, remember the context. The main false teaching that Paul is fighting is legalism. So why would Paul counter legalism and rule keeping by teaching legalism and rule keeping? If he's teaching them these lists as just laws that they need to obey, that wouldn't really make sense when that's what he's fighting against. Rather, this is gospel-motivated, spirit-empowered life that Paul calls each group to. So the first group Paul addresses is older men. And look with me again at verse 2. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. So we're older men in this society expected to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, and sound in faith, love, and steadfastness? No, they were not. The fact that Paul puts any expectation on older men was revolutionary to the Cretan culture. He is saying they don't get to do whatever they want, and there is an expectation of them to be respectable. Sober-minded is also translated temperate. They must not be getting drunk. Dignified is also translated as worthy of respect. So they don't get to demand the respect of others. They need to be worthy of that respect. They are to be self-controlled, which is a characteristic to each group that Paul addresses. They must control their urges and passions and desires. Again, this is completely countercultural. They are to be sound in faith, love, and steadfastness. Being sound in faith, love, and steadfastness is what makes these men worthy of respect. Can you imagine the impact it would have on this Greco-Roman world when older men were sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, and sound in faith, love, and steadfastness? What would it do to the watching world to see men who serve in love rather than command and dominate? The gospel is reflected through this, ki through this kind of behavior. So let's move into our second category, older women. And again, we covered this in our homework, but what is our connecting word that we see at the beginning of verse 3? Likewise. Likewise. Likewise, which tells us that Paul is saying in the same way, Older women are called to something that is like what older men are called to. And look again with me at verse 3. Older women, are li older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good and so train the young women. And we'll stop there for now. Just like older men, older women are to be respectable, dignified, and self-controlled. 
So what does this look like specifically for older women in Crete? Well, it makes sense that in this Cretan culture where everyone acts however they want, that older women would act and speak with carelessness. And it's not really that hard to imagine what this looks like, right? Middle-aged women viciously gossiping about so-and-so over a few too many glasses of Chardonnay. This is consistent with Paul's overall criticism of the Cretan culture. Just like Paul gave Titus instructions to speak and live in such a way that contrasted the false teachers, he is calling older women to behavior that contrasts that of older women in Cretan society. Paul's not merely saying to not get drunk or slander, but he's using these common pitfalls in this society to contrast what a Christian older woman is to look like. And again, this would cause the surrounding culture to wonder why they were different, right? When Carol Creighton is converted to Christianity and she stops going out for drinks and gossip with the girls and instead shows kindness to them and is encouraging of others and speaks respectfully of others, you can be sure they will ask questions. Paul also says that older women are to teach what is good and so train the younger women. So what is the good that Paul is speaking about? Is it womanhood? Is it how to cook a turkey and sue the fussy baby? Is it feminine virtues or is it something else? I think again, our literary context helps us with this. Remember that the theme of this entire letter is doctrine before deeds, doctrine before deeds. It's not simply actions, but it's the doctrine that's behind those actions. Look with me at verse five, that the word of God may not be reviled. There is a purpose to the actions that Paul calls women to. The actions in and of themselves are not the point, but the word of God not being reviled is the point. Again, look with me at verse 10, when he says, so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our savior. These two phrases, that and so that, are our purpose statement. Not reviling the gospel, but beautifying gospel is the point. So what's the good that Paul is talking about in verse 3? I believe that the what is good is doctrine, and the so train the young women to is the deeds. So again, doctrine before deeds. Christy Anyawible says it this way. We need more than practical instruction. Often when we read Titus 2, 1 through 5, we read these verses as very practical instructions the Lord hands us down from pastor to older women to younger women. It is true that how we live before God and man matters, how those of us who are wives and mothers treat our husbands and children is crucial to the love, joy, and peace we share in the home. Paul teaches that faithfulness in these practical matters makes the word of God attractive and honored, serving as evidence of the grace of God at work in us who are saved by the gospel of Christ. However, if we settle for taking care of practical concerns, focusing solely on our roles and conduct, we will fail to grasp the greater redemptive purpose in our practice. We will fail to root our endeavors in the gospel. We will fail to have our character shaped by the spirit in all of life. We will therefore diminish our calling as redeemed women of God. So do you get what she's saying? If the focus of our teaching is biblical womanhood or gender roles only, then we're missing out on the really is the point of all of this. Paul's point here is godliness that shows off the goodness of God. And Paul continues to emphasize doctrine before deeds in verse 3. Look with me at what he says to younger women. They are to teach what is good and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Paul is get, again is saying these are the kinds of things that godliness looks like for this group. This list is illustrative, not exhaustive. So it's illustrative, it's not exhaustive. The them-then context tells us that young women would be at home. They didn't have a choice. This was before the Industrial Revolution, before the mommy wars were a thing, before women really had any choices about education and employment. Again, Paul is addressing them within their sphere of influence. They already are at home with husbands and children, and he is telling them to be busy at home rather than a lazy glutton. He is calling them to love their husbands and children rather than live like an evil beast. Paul's point is not their location, it's their actions. He is calling them to something that looks very different from their surrounding culture. And in so doing, God's word is not reviled. What's amazing about this 
is that in a society that didn't value women, Paul, and ultimately God, is saying that women mattered to the kingdom of God. Women mattered to the church. This wasn't a command to restrict women and keep them in their place, but it was a revolutionary valuing of women. There's also an assumption that women must know God's word. If their actions lead to God's word not being reviled, then their actions must be aligned with God's word, which implies that they know God's word. Paul is echoing what Jesus told Martha in Luke 10, 41 through 42. Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Do you guys remember the story? Martha's in the kitchen cooking and doing all the hospitality, and Mary is sitting at Jesus' feet learning. And Martha's mad that Mary's not doing her domestic duties, right? And Jesus tells her that Mary chose the better thing. Jesus said that Mary had chosen the right priority, not Martha. Paul's emphasis for women here is consistent with Jesus' emphasis for his female disciples. Their knowledge and love of his word is what he cares about, not how organized your kitchen cabinets are. Unlike the women exploiting Zeus, Jesus was unique in his honoring and valuing the lives and voices of women. Jesus encouraged women to learn from him, and he called women to be his disciples, which would have been shocking and scandalous in his historical context. Women ministered to and alongside Jesus. Women were the first ones to tell of Jesus' resurrection, at a time in history when women's testimonies were not given any credibility, at a time when women, especially emotional women, were viewed as hysterical. Women may have been belittled in this world, but Jesus values and honors them by giving them a place in his kingdom and telling them that their lives are just as valuable in displaying the gospel as everyone else on this list. So women, younger and older, let's get busy with our mission. You are uniquely able to show off the beauty of Christ by how you live because of what you believe. Our fourth category is younger men. Look with me at verse 6. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. And again, he says likewise in this transition. Did you catch that? It was, there's something similar to, <clears throat> not unique from, not uniquely distinct from younger women. Younger men similarly reflect well on the word of God through their behavior. However, they're not given a list, just be self-controlled. And again, this was a revolutionary expectation for this group of people in this specific context where men were permitted to do pretty much whatever they wanted, being called to self-control was radically different from the surrounding culture and would surely cause unbelievers to wonder why these young men were different from what was expected of them. Paul is not calling men to be men and women to be women, but he is calling men and women to be Christ-like. He calls men and women to partake of the Great Commission to go and make disciples of all nations. Paul's aim for his audience in this passage is not to make sure that men are doing the leading and women are doing the following. His aim in this passage is to charge men and women to live lives that makes the watching Cretan world wonder what makes them different. The last group of people that Paul lists are slaves or bondservants. In the first century, one out of three people in Rome and one out of five elsewhere were slaves. That's a staggering number of people. Some of the slaves were, um, some were slaves after being kidnapped and forced to work in fields and mines. Some were prisoners of war that were, for, that were forced into slavery. Some were children that were sold into slavery by destitute parents. <clears throat> some people <coughs> who couldn't afford to pay their debt would become slaves voluntarily and some were horribly abused and mistreated by their masters. Some were considered members of their family and were treated with honor despite their status. Some slaves were more educated than their masters. And regardless of how they became slaves, Paul again does not comment on the validity of this social structure, but rather addresses his audience where they are. This isn't because slavery is condoned by God, it's not any treatment of one person to another that undermines their dignity and personhood is despicable in God's eyes. Yet we see that, like women, God values and honors those whom the world deems valueless and dishonorable. 
So look with me at verses 9 through 10. Slaves are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith, so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. He tells slaves to submit to their masters and seek to please them, to not argue with them or steal from them, to be trustworthy. Again, there's a purpose to this, that, the, that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. Isn't it interesting that the two groups of people, young women and slaves, who are told explicitly to submit are the most vulnerable, yet are given specific encouragements that they uniquely adorn the gospel. In doing this, Paul is elevating the status of women and slaves in the kingdom of God. He is telling them, this world you find yourself in might strip you of your dignity and rights, but in God's kingdom, you are highly valued. In God's kingdom, your life matters. He gives specific encouragement and hope to those who need it most. So in our next lesson, we'll talk more about the gospel message that motivates these godly characteristics. But for now, let's just notice that the gospel is the great equalizer of all people. Men and women, older and younger, free and slave, are all given specific commands about behavior that is befitting to the gospel. No one is given a free pass. No one is told they are above accountability. No one is more important than another. Every single person Paul addresses is part of a shared mission. So we looked at them then, we looked at how this points us to the gospel, and so now let's look at us now. And as we break up into our application discussion groups, let's, I lost my place, let's apply this to us now. Paul lists what kinds of expressions of godliness are unique to each area's each group's area of influence, but we live in a world where the lines are not so distinct between men and women, older and younger. Many of us are unmarried or don't have children. Many of us work outside the home. So the question isn't your domestic achievements. The question is, what does godliness look like for you in your specific place? And this will vary from person to person. If you are married <clears throat> with children, then are you loving your husband and children? What are the specific ways that you are tempted? What are the specific things God is calling you to obey him in? As we discuss these things, let's also demonstrate the gospel and how we talk about these things, showing grace and respect and love to one another. God has called each of us to a different sphere of influence, and it's a good thing that there is diversity among us in what God has called us to. We obey him because we love him, and we love him the more we know him. He is worthy of our obedience and our very lives, and we can trust him as we seek to honor him through our actions. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for calling us to such a high calling. Lord, thank you for, for being such a good savior, for seeing us with, with love and compassion. God, thank you for this scandalous, grace that you show us. God, thank you for calling all of us to equally serve you, to, to be partakers of this shared mission. Lord, pray for each woman here that she would see herself as important in your kingdom. Lord, I pray that you would be convicting us of areas that we can love you more, that we can obey you more, not as a checklist, not as legalism, but out of love for you and out of excitement that we get to partake in this shared mission, God. Pray for, um, just for our hearts, God, that we would be excited about the gospel, that we would see you as being worthy of our very lives, of every action that we do adorning the gospel. Lord, would you please be with us now? Give us words of encouragement and love for one another as we discuss these things. In Jesus' name, amen.